Never in humanity's history has there been a commodity so conflicted as uranium. This fantastic element born of the stars can be both a blessing of energy production or a curse of nuclear annihilation, being extraordinarily effective in both cases. As the race begins to a carbon neutral planet and the reduction of fossil fuels, nuclear energy presents an attractive option to effectively lower harmful emissions while providing the power needed to keep our world moving forward. But what about the dark stains on the reputation of this element? Nuclear disasters like Chernobyl and the merciless destruction unleashed by the atomic bomb during the Second World War are often cited as reasons we should disregard nuclear as an option and leave our planet's veritable treasure trove of uranium resources in the ground for good. However, for the first time in years, a conflicting voice is rising up in unison, one that commends nuclear as perhaps the only way to save the planet from climate change. Environmentalists, corporations, and world governments are starting to roll out the red carpet for nuclear energy, seeing it as a cost-effective and environmentally sound path to steer away from polluting fuels like oil and coal. On today's episode of Commodity Culture, we'll be talking about the good, the bad, and the radioactive, from incredible facts about uranium's interplanetary origins to power plant malfunctions and meltdowns and to a conclusion about the role to come for uranium in humanity's energy economy. Uranium is as complex as it is paradoxical, a versatile element with dormant powers both inspiring and terrifying. It is made up of 92 electrons and protons and 146 neutrons, has an atomic weight of 238 atomic mass units and a half-life of around 4 billion years. Uranium on Earth is believed to have originally been produced in one or more supernova stars some 6 billion years ago. This process is described by the Oxford Dictionary of Physics as an explosive brightening of a star in which the energy radiated by it increases by a factor of 10 billion. A supernova explosion occurs when a star has burned up all its available nuclear fuel and the core collapses catastrophically. This collapse causes the ejection of the star's remnants into space and uranium is a major part of that explosive reaction. Research also indicates that uranium could be formed as the result of a merger between neutron stars. The extreme density of this kind of star, a whopping 5 billion tons per teaspoon, causes it to react violently when it meets its twin in space. Gravitational forces cause the stars to converge and generate intense gravitational waves, along with the mass production not only of uranium, but of gold and platinum as well. Cosmochemists, and yes, that's a thing, have been examining and contemplating the patterns and trends in the data when it comes to the origins of uranium for quite some time now, and new truths may yet be uncovered in the future that lies ahead. Despite its mysterious and fantastic origin story, uranium is actually one of the most common elements in the Earth's crust, right along with tin and tungsten and also occurs naturally to some degree in seawater. Amazingly, although it is now rare in our solar system, the uranium still present in the ground is the provider of the main heat source within the core of our planet. This is the result of a slow radioactive decay, which is a part of uranium's natural life cycle. The resulting heat and radiation contribute to continental drift, or the movement of the Earth that results in the shifting of continents over the millennia. As if all of that wasn't insane enough, there have been at least 17 naturally occurring nuclear reactors mentioned in scientific literature that went online due to water spontaneously interacting with radiation emitted from uranium. They were all located in Gabon, West Africa, and over their incredible 2 million year lifetimes, they produced approximately 5.4 tons of fission and 1.5 tons of plutonium products into the surrounding ore body. In modern history, uranium has two main use cases, completely paradoxical to each other. A clean, carbon neutral, and highly efficient form of energy production, and an instrument of the most horrific destruction imaginable, that could lay the whole planet to waste were it fully unleashed. 
Nuclear reactors create intense heat from the splitting of uranium atoms, known as nuclear fission, which then generates steam that powers turbines to then generate electricity. The reactors consist of three main components. The first is fuel bundles, made of thin rods filled with fissionable nuclei, which consists of uranium-235 or uranium-238. The bundles are placed in the reactor core, and the fission which takes place is moderated by the second component, water. The water acts as a moderator by slowing down the speed of the energy in neutrons produced by nuclear fission, thus allowing for a sustained chain reaction that ensures the fission occurs at a reliable rate. This process is further refined through the use of control rods, made of boron or cadmium, which absorb the excess neutrons produced in the water to prevent further reactions. The control rods can be withdrawn to increase the rate of reaction and inserted again to slow the reaction down. This ensures a steady output of energy is maintained. The way this whole process works could warrant its own video and indeed there are many you can find on YouTube if you're interested in diving deeper. But suffice to say, this energy source is highly efficient. One fuel bundle of uranium contains the same amount of energy as approximately 70,000 gallons of oil and could power a single home for 100 years. We'll explore the devastating effects of nuclear weaponry up ahead in our history section, but for now, let's take a look at how uranium is extracted from the Earth. The mining of uranium was first implemented on a large scale in the Czech Republic in the late 19th century. Once it was discovered that uranium could be converted into plutonium in a nuclear reactor in 1944 and thus be used to create weaponry, American Brigadier General Leslie Groves and his opaquely named Combined Development Trust moved swiftly to mine as much of it as possible, pouring $40 million into uranium mining in just three years of operations. Today, the vast majority of the world's uranium is mined for the purpose of creating nuclear fuel to provide energy, and as I'll be mentioning from time to time, it's one of the cleanest burning fuels around and really easy on the environment. Over 50% of uranium deposits today use the in situ method of mining. Using this method, water wells are drilled into the uranium ore body and groundwater is circulated with oxygen. When oxygen is added to the water, it rusts the rock. Rusting uranium changes its color from ash gray to various bright shades of yellow. This yellow oxidized uranium is soluble and it's brought to the surface and extracted from the water through a treatment process. Although in situ is the preferred method of mining, there are some deposits that are only accessible through conventional mining. In conventional uranium mines, the rock is extracted from the earth either in tunnels underground mined with drill bits studded with tungsten carbide, or for more shallow deposits, dug up from the surface through pits created by excavators, known as open pit mining. When dealing with tunnel-based deposits, miners operate equipment by remote control to minimize exposure to radiation emanating from the ore and protect themselves from falling rocks in the mine. After mining, the ore is taken by trucks to a mill facility, where it is ground and crushed before being leached in large tanks. The resulting solution is then taken through a number of refining steps, which eventually end in drying the finished product into yellow cake and packing it into drums. The next stage in the process sees the yellow cake shipped to a conversion facility, where it is further processed for use as nuclear fuel. The area of the world with the highest grade uranium deposits is the Athabasca Basin in Saskatchewan, Canada, often referred to as the Saudi Arabia of uranium. Some of the world's largest uranium mining companies are located here, and some of the deposit grades are so incredible, no other area of the planet can even come close. Other prominent uranium-rich areas include Niger and Namibia in Africa, Australia, Russia, and perhaps most notably, Kazakhstan, which has been one of the world's leading producers for quite some time. The Kazakhs started exploring for uranium way back in 1943, and the country currently boasts 50 known deposits of uranium across six of its provinces, as well as being home to one of the biggest uranium companies in the world, Kazatomprom.
Although it was Eugene Pelligaud, a French professor of analytical chemistry who first isolated pure uranium in 1841, Uranium oxide was first extracted from pitchblende and identified by German chemist Martin Klaproth in 1789. However, uranium has been known of since at least 79 AD, when uranium oxide was used as a coloring agent for ceramic glazes and glass in the Roman Empire, although they didn't recognize it as uranium at that time. The world's first nuclear power plant used to generate electricity was the Obninsk nuclear power plant in the Soviet Union, which went online June 27, 1954. As it stands today in 2021, there are approximately 443 nuclear reactors operational in some 30 countries around the globe. Although nuclear energy is one of the safest, cleanest, and most efficient forms of energy currently accessible on planet Earth, its dark history, arising from the devastating effects of nuclear weapons and accidents such as those at Chernobyl and Fukushima, has left fear in the hearts of the general public to this very day. The widespread destruction resulting from the first atomic bombs being dropped on Japan during the Second World War is almost unimaginable. Americans were first in the race to nuclear armament, and they used it with deadly efficiency, dropping an atomic bomb on Hiroshima on the morning of what was a particularly beautiful summer's day in August of 1945. 43 seconds after being released from the B-29 bomber plane Enola Gay, named after the mother of pilot Colonel Paul Tibbetts, the bomb detonated. For those fortunate enough to be outside the center of the blast, they immediately got lifted up and thrown violently at high velocity into their surroundings. Some survived, and at least it was better than being one of the tens of thousands of people near the center of the impact who were simply just evaporated instantly. No blood and no pain, just instant oblivion. The resulting fires burned for days and destroyed a four square mile area of the city. And for those who didn't succumb to fatal burns, many died from the effects of radiation poisoning in the days, months, and years that followed. The generational impact of birth defects due to the radiation is still being felt to this day. In addition to all of this, the US dropped yet another atomic bomb onto Japan, this time in Nagasaki, but days later with similar results, which drove the Japanese to finally surrender, putting an end to World War II. President Truman, who issued the orders to drop the bombs, attempted to reassure the general public that this great tragedy was necessary to save countless more lives by ending the war. History may be the judge but I'm not so sure I believe him. On the other side of the coin for uranium, it really does provide one of the cleanest, safest, and most efficient forms of energy in nuclear, making it ideal, and some would say essential, in the move towards a carbon neutral future. There are, of course, deep controversies surrounding nuclear energy as well, mainly driven by the handful of plant accidents that have occurred, perhaps none so catastrophic as the Chernobyl meltdown. April 25th, 1986, Pripyat, Ukraine, in what was then the Soviet Union. The Chernobyl 4 reactor crew were preparing to test new voltage regulator designs that would help increase the time the core reactor could still be cooled in the case of a loss of main electricity generation at the plant. The ensuing accident was largely viewed as being caused by a lack of safety culture in the Soviet Union. But Chernobyl's RBMK, a Russian acronym that roughly translates to High Power Channel Reactor, had an extremely flawed design from the start that greatly increased the chances of it failing at some point. Worst of all, the operators who were controlling the plant had no idea of the inherent design flaws in the reactor, and so were not prepared for the disaster that followed. While employees began running the voltage regulator tests, there was a lack of communication between operators who ran highly sensitive parts of the system and safety personnel on site. A blatant disregard for the minimum allowable 15 control rods required according to operating procedures, using only eight, certainly played a role in the outcome as well. The complexities of this disaster are so deep that I won't go into all the factors that led up to the initial explosion, but two of them occurred in total. The first being a steam explosion, with a second following a few seconds later, mainly attributed to zirconium steam reactions. 
Structural materials and fuel were blasted out of the explosions, igniting fires to the surrounding area and exposing the now destroyed core to the atmosphere. The blast immediately killed one worker on the spot and another in the hospital a few hours later. The ensuing smoke that was emitted from the reactor also carried with it radioactive fission products that spread into the surrounding atmosphere and 22 plant workers, along with six of the initial firefighters who came to the blast zone, were later felled by acute radiation poisoning as a result of the exposure. Of course, the Chernobyl disaster had a far-reaching effect on the Soviet Union beyond just the initial casualties, and it is without a doubt the worst nuclear accident to date. So when it comes to using uranium to provide energy, is the benefit worth the potential danger and could we see another incident like Chernobyl again in the future? While nothing is impossible, the safety protocols and oversight have massively improved in the nuclear energy sector over the years, and both the design of new plants and the upgrades available to existing ones provide a practically fail-safe level of protection from something as catastrophic as a core meltdown occurring. The truth is, we can't be 100% sure what the future holds. But I believe the benefits of nuclear far outweigh the risks, and I'll explain why as we look into the role of uranium in the years ahead. Two other notable nuclear accidents were Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania in 1979, and of course the Fukushima disaster in 2011. And although both certainly had a negative impact, nuclear energy still accounts for an extremely small percentage of deaths from energy production worldwide, clocking in well below coal, oil, and natural gas. In fact, a paper from NASA's Goddard Institute in the journal Environmental Science and Technology in 2013 concluded that 1.84 million lives had been saved from 1971 to 2009, thanks to the reduction in air pollution afforded by using nuclear energy instead of burning fossil fuels. Although nuclear energy used to have a lot of detractors, and certainly still does, more and more environmentalists, governments, and ESG-focused companies have woken up to the fact that nuclear power is not the boogeyman it's been made out to be by agenda-driven politicians and ill-informed media pundits. Renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, and hydro will almost certainly play a role, and a mix of these, along with nuclear, can push us closer to carbon neutrality. At the moment, the logistics of moving to purely renewable from both a technical and economic perspective are tenuous at best, and nuclear's rise from the ashes presents an opportunity that I believe humanity needs to seize. Although it's the decision like Germany's baffling order to phase nuclear energy out that make headlines, the truth is that nuclear power is on the rise all around the globe. China, India, South Korea, the UAE, Turkey, Russia, Japan, and many other countries currently have new nuclear reactors under construction. The decree put forth by the Paris Climate Agreement has created a race to carbon neutral, but those who are in a rush to get there would do well to mind just what price they are willing to pay to label themselves green, as the adoption of wide-scale renewable energy requires an incredible amount of fossil fuels to bring online, along with a host of other issues. Large-scale development of nuclear power is the most reliable and fastest way to a carbon-neutral planet. And although still looked down upon in some political circles, the truth of the power of nuclear and uranium has a real shot of being revealed in the years to come. And that's good news for planet Earth. Commodity Culture is a series that covers the history and culture surrounding commodities and natural resources. If you enjoyed this episode and want to see more, please subscribe and hit the bell notification to ensure you are always alerted of the latest episodes.